We're at the 2022 ABA Ag Bankers Conference in Omaha. Right into Ed Elfman. Hey, Ed, great to see you. Good to see you again. Glad, glad to be on. Ed is Senior Vice President of Ag and Rural Banking Policy with the American Bankers Association. And uh, Ed, for those who don't know, again, a little background about you and your, your path to getting to ABA. Yeah, uh, I don't know if it's a usual path or an unusual path. Uh, I grew up on a dairy farm in central Minnesota. We still farm there. Uh, yields are looking good this year. Just talked to my dad earlier today. They're cutting corn, trying to get done up there. What I did is I went to DC, did an internship with National Corn Growers Association. Then they hired me. And then I ended up on Capitol Hill for a couple of years. And I've been with ABA for 10 years. And I'm not that old to work somewhere for a decade. But uh, they say, I don't know if that path is normal or not normal, but we find in D.C. a lot of folks that get into the ag space have some sort of tie back to agriculture. And I, I'm so blessed I get to work on something I love every single day uh, and learn about banking at the same time. I mean, it's every day I'm learning something new. And that's what you ask for in life, right, is to be able to keep learning and find new things. So, Well, you've, you've teed this up perfectly, the ABA Ag Bankers Conference. Uh, and you, you and I talked earlier about those who come for the first time and they're blown away by the amount of content, information, and the contacts they make here. It's an amazing show. Yeah, we're, we're well over 600 people, which is crazy to think about in its own right, right? There's 1,800 banks in the United States that are considered agricultural banks. And we have 600 folks here. Um, and I think what's important with this conference is that it is put together by bankers for bankers. So we have a panel of bankers. We start meeting in February and they decide what the content's gonna be. So when you come to this conference, the content's not made up by some vendor or by staffers in DC hoping that people like what they hear. It's put together by agricultural bankers from across the country. So you get some really good speakers out of that. And we always joke, this isn't a golfing conference. This is an educational conference. You walk away learning something. From the conferences I've attended, you could easily have producers here and they would be walking away with an amazing amount of, of information. This is, this is not heavy on the banking side, it's heavy on the ag side. Correct, and I think that says a lot about the bankers, right? Our bankers don't want to have a conversation about how do you trade money or what do you, I mean, they, they want to talk about the issues at hand in the industry so they can understand what their customers are going through. And don't ever forget, a lot of our bankers are farmers themselves, so for them, they're, they're getting that good information. I will say, all are welcome. All are welcome. You don't have to be a banker to come to this conference. Um, some sessions might not be as relevant for you if you're not, but if you're a producer and you want to just come learn what we're talking about, this is a perfect opportunity, and we'll, we'll take you. We'll take all comers. Okay, even though we're not necessarily talking uh, about banking, deep into the banking side, there are some banking issues that that are are forefront, and one of those is ECORA. It's an acronym. What is it and what's it mean? So ECORA is the Enhancing Credit Opportunities in Rural America Act. Essentially what we're looking to do, it, it's a farmer-friendly bill that we've been advocating to lower interest rates for farmers. Now how would that work? You remove tax burden on the banking industry, to put a loan together, you have a cost factor. If you lower the cost for the bank to make a loan, you can lower your interest rates. And we very much view it as a way to help farmers in this rising interest rate environment, right? I don't know one producer that's gonna say, you know what, I like higher interest rate. I'd hate to have a reduction happen because of a piece of legislation. So we're really looking at moving this forward. It's a top five priority for ABA coming into the next Congress. It's amazing the amount of time of staff work and folks we put into this across the country. I know you've talked to some other people here as well about the issue at the state level. It just shows you there's multiple states, uh, all of our folks internally, and we want to make sure that ECORA gets over the finish line to help farmers, especially as we're looking at farm bill policy and some other things happening this year. But at the end of the day, this is a tax bill that the bankers are pushing to help farm producers. We have been talking to agricultural groups trying to get them on board with it. Uh, don't be surprised if you're a producer that you eventually hear about this or are asked to vote on it or however your, your organization might work um, because we're pushing it pretty hard. 
because we, we feel it's very important for the industry overall. And frankly, a big part of Ecora is rural sustainability. We want to we want to keep community banks strong in these in these rural areas, and one way to do it is help them on the tax burden side of the world, right? Keep their customers strong, keep the bank strong, keep your small town strong as well. There's some opposition to this. I, I can't imagine what that might be, but what is the opposition, and are there some valid points there? A little bit of the opposition comes from this has never existed before. Um, we've had a bifurcated system for quite a while uh, with our with our lenders and how it's set up. And frankly, I, I think it's the fear of the unknown uh, is where the opposition comes from. Because I'll be honest, there's been a long time of maybe us not being so friendly with uh, the other side of lending and agriculture. But I'll put it out there, this is not this is not intended to go after any of that. Actually, if you look at the legislation, we stole a lot of stuff from their legislation. Uh, we're <laughs> imitation's the greatest form of flattery, right? And we, we want parity across the board. We want a level playing field. And ultimately, we believe increasing competition is going to help farmers. And that's what this is all about. And, and we got to have strong rural communities, right? And by having strong farmers, having strong banks, you have strong rural communities. So. I don't know how much opposition per se. Um, it seems to be more, more of a fear of the unknown, I think is a, is a good way to put it. One thing I should mention with Ecora, it's not, not just ag real estate, which is what we've talked about a lot, is the ag real estate side of it, but there's a housing component as well. So if you're in an area of less than 2,500 and you have a rural mortgage, you would qualify under this. So you could have potentially lower interest rates on rural residences. I know we have a lot of issues in rural housing right now. This makes a lot of sense, right? I've heard multiple senators, I was actually laughing during one uh, Senate Banking Committee hearing. They're talking about rural housing and how the costs are going up, et cetera, et cetera. I'm laughing myself. I go, you're talking about our bill. You just don't realize it. So part of it's getting the message out. Um, and then the other part is just making sure that the fear of the unknown is those fears are taken away over time. We do this on every bill we've ever done, right? It's just part of the gig. but. We're getting there. We're getting closer. And like I say, your, your folks are going to hear about this a lot from the banking industry, from the state level, the federal level. It's going to be a top five priority for us going into the next year. You mentioned rural communities and strong rural communities. That's been a, a, a linchpin, if you will, for something known as the Farm Bill. Right. Uh, we think of the Farm Bill as just being for production ag, but really that's such a small portion of it. When you look at the farm bill and the idea of writing a new farm bill or extending the existing bill, what do you see coming in 23? So I, I'm going to start with why do bankers care about the farm bill, right? Because I think some folks go, Wait, why do you have a stake in this, right? Um, because when people think bankers, people are thinking Wall Street and the three-piece suits and all that stuff. Have you seen a three-piece suit at this conference, yeah. right? What you see here is a lot of bank poles and jeans, right? These are rural folks in rural communities. And the farm bill for really shifted in the late 80s, early 90s, not be just production. It's that idea of rural, right? Everything there. So we care about, well, there's 11 titles in the farm bill, and I think we care about 10 of them, mm -hmm. right? We care about rural development. We care about the conservation programs. We care about the credit, there's a credit title in the farm bill. A lot of people don't even realize that. We care about the credit title, what happens there? I'm gonna start on the production side, a couple things that we're watching. We don't necessarily advocate for, if, remember the old direct loan pay, or direct payments, right? We don't advocate one way or another on direct payments. We don't advocate one way or another on ARC or PLC. What we advocate on when we're looking at commodity programs and things along those lines, is basically down the line how it will affect lenders. I, I always jokingly say with my folks, we're like the third person to be, be hit by this thing. Because if you change a commodity program and it changes a customer's cash flow, then that affects us as bankers, right? So it's a weird spot to be for me because I'm not actually talking about one particular thing. I have to look at con unintended and intended consequences. So we're tracking that side. Crop insurance is probably the biggest thing we will advocate on a lot. We're big believers in crop insurance. It needs to exist. It's risk management for us from a lending side. And it's protection for farmers, 
right? So there's your production side. You get into the dairy title. There's dairy insurance programs. There's things going on there. We're always tracking those. We would like to see more producers use the dairy insurance programs. Again, selfishly, risk management, protecting our banks and our lending portfolios. Uh, so you, there's two titles already, right? In the credit title, and it's the big one for us, that's where you see the FSA guaranteed loan programs. And a lot of our lenders participate in the guaranteed loan programs because it's a way to either get beginning farmers in and have them uh, be able to acquire some credit they might not otherwise be able to acquire. Or you might have somebody who has a dip in their operation and they need to use the programs and it's a way to carry them through and make sure that they're still in a good place. Um, so we're big supporters of the guaranteed loan programs. We haven't picked a number yet, but we do believe the programs need to get bigger. The lending limit is about 1.88 million right in there. We'd like to see that get over the 2 million mark, partly because farms are getting bigger. We just got to have more capacity to, to help different operations as they, they come in and want to use the program. And then the other side we use quite a bit is the rural development program. And I think a lot of folks don't realize within rural development, and you don't wrap your head around this because it's a farm bill, right? Affectionately, it's the farm bill, but it's really the, the farm and rural bill. Rural development has everything from business loans to housing loans to uh, you can finance like a fire truck through the community facilities program because fire trucks are $150,000, right? The fire department can't buy that with cash. So it's a way that we can put a guaranteed loan on it and use the program. So. You can see across the board where we care about Farm Bill and all the different parts. Um, it just it does start to get into the weeds a little bit, uh, but it's fun for me because every single day there's a hearing. Every time there's a hearing, you got to track what's going on, what it looks like. So uh. now we've also heard at this conference that net farm income 21 22 has been in pretty good shape but has been tied back to those government payments. Yeah. Is, is that a concern moving forward? Ha, possibly less money, writing a new farm bill. How do we balance everything? Yes and no. Um, so I say yes and no because a lot of our folks, it's less about, you can't determine an ad hoc payment, right? So farmer suddenly gets a check for 64000 or whatever. You can't write that into your cash flow just comes out of nowhere. Um, all you can do is help manage that you know, asset acquisition and make sure that it fits into the overall plan. So what we're watching more is what the overall programs look like, right? So if you change reference prices on Arkham PLC, what would that do to cash flow statements? That's more the way we look at it. Um, as far as the actual government payments popping in and out, since they're ad hoc, uh, we don't really rely on them or follow them too much. It's actually funny when uh, direct payments went away. That was something in hindsight we didn't realize how much how easy it made it for us because we knew what a producer was guaranteed to receive. Now we have producers that, I mean, they'll get a check in September that was not an anticipated part of what we were doing. So I think lending's changed uh, quite a bit since the 2018 Farm Bill went in place because we had to adhere to the kind of these new rules, right? And then banking regulations require us not to just pick a number and hope it works, right? We've got to work, work through that process. So are we watching? Are we worried? In a way, um, I'd probably say we're more worried about if there are any potential cuts to crop insurance. We'd worry about that a lot more than some program changes, if that makes sense. So, so covered a lot of ground, but as we move into 2023, uh, Maybe some winds of change coming. There, there, we're hearing uh, some concerns from those who who spoke at this conference. Do you still find optimism in the future? Well, the theme of the conference is resiliency <laughs> in agriculture, right? Um, we've had 70 of these conferences, and I bet in all 70 of them there was a sign of optimism and a sign of pessimism, right? Um, that's just agriculture. We ebb and flow. Um, I think at the end of the day, our bankers have done a great job of figuring out how to work with their customers to make their operation work best. And there's always optimism because, heck, you might have that biggest yield you've never had. I mean, I was talking to my dad earlier today, 
I said, how, are we over 200? He's like, we'll be like 210. You know, he's happy as could be. Um, but next year we might be 170 on corn. We have no idea. So I, I think from that perspective, um, bankers just use, used to these ebbs and flows and have figured out how to lend in a way that, that you don't get shocked. Maybe is the best way to put it. You don't get shocked like you used to. Um, is there some pessimism around here? Sure, there always is. There always is. That's agriculture, right? It's, uh, it's as uh, John Kennedy said, it's the only industry where you uh, you buy at retail and sell at wholesale, right? So we're used to this industry being this way. Um, but I think there's optimism. There always is. Like genetics are getting better, technology's getting better. There's there's a bright future in agriculture, and maybe the last thing I'll say on it, you start looking around this conference, it's not a bunch of 65-year-olds. There's a lot of people in their 20s and 30s here. So our future is bright on the ag lending side of the world. We got a next generation coming, and they might look at things a little differently, they might approach things differently, and it might not be the worst thing either to have that next generation come through and keep this industry strong and chugging forward. Ed. Great to see you. Thanks for your time, your insight. Let's do this again. Will do. Thanks for having me on. Again, it's Ed Elfman, Senior Vice President of Ag and Rural Policy with the American Bankers Association. We're in Omaha, Nebraska for the 2022 ABA Ag Bankers Conference. I'm Tony St. James.